YouTube is transitioning. YouTube creators are transitioning. They're becoming older. They're becoming wiser. They're becoming more thoughtful. As the death of the amazing atheist becomes TJ Kirk, we mark it as a transition point. Now, TJ lost a lot of subscribers during this transition of his life from the amazing atheist to TJ Kirk. But I, it, I think it's a, it's a noteworthy event in that we see this idea of atheism, these conversations of atheism, this atheism as a um, ideology fade. It never had a substantive, cohesive idea behind it. So there's some irony in that when we have people start establishing escaping atheism, which is an, a mockery of themselves. They are a little late. Maybe they'll even claim success. See what we did? We, we have ridded the YouTube of atheism. But atheism has been on the way out for a while, meaning in terms of a conversational plot. More important issues have emerged, and they're related in an interesting way, but your values in terms of secular values versus purely Christian values, not recognizing the comparison, the friendships we want to cross beliefs, and the co-relationship of free speech, and how important free speech is in terms of the dialogue of anything we want to talk about, whether it be atheism, Christianity, or whatever, we need a foundation to talk about it. It isn't a minor issue that we're doing as we transition. Um, and I would have to go and, and research specific people like Sargon Akkad, how atheistic, I know he's an atheist, but I don't think that's been particularly ever his genre. It has been a... There's interesting labels that people have been using to describe um, libtards and other kinds of anti-leftist rhetoric has emerged. Now, I don't really consider myself anywhere on the spectrum. Uh, probably a lot of people would label me liberal, and then maybe sometimes they would think I'm conservative. Uh, because I think there's a mixture of what is best for reasons, not what is best because of an ideology. I seriously doubt that there is a pure ideology that's going to work. Uh, there's going to be elements of different ideas that build into this. I don't think even people that are conservative or consider themselves left, if they're into the free speech, really understand what's important, they're not going to... Um, be too extreme in their perception, at least not yet. Maybe if they get a head of steam. Recently, TJ did a video on that guy, T, and heavily criticized by TJ for saying he would be willing to align himself with fascists. Um, and in a sense, I agree with TJ. It's really a bad idea, but not to be outdone by Mr. T. That guy, T, not Mr. T. Interesting slip up there. Anyways. There is a strategic imperative in terms of strategizing how best to undermine a specific regime. And when you align yourself with unsavory characters to bring down a specific ideology, um, you have to have a real understanding of where that end goal is and why would you have such an end goal. The problem is we end up narrowing our values when we take on people that have narrow values. They minimize the values you have. So you can't focus on the broad spectrum of values. You're forced into narrowing your values to be compatible with the diverse group of people you're working with. Um, free speech can do that to you, where you may not agree on many different areas, but you want to agree on free speech and you want to give your voice behind it. Uh, and there's a point at which it can be problematic if you lose control of the other aspects of why free speech is good in terms of where you want to take the conversation and really the frustration for people like David Rubin and Sam Harris and other free speech advocates is that in a way they have to sacrifice the more in-depth conversations the more complicated arguments for another day because you, we can't even get the basics right of free speech. Uh, and this is where it's important and I like to see the transition. There's a lot of people I really don't fully agree with but I think their foundations are better than the mainstream. And one of the key things that we need to be um, concerned with is honesty. And that's why I did the, the, the YouTube about Noel Plum and being attacked, but he's really basically dishonest people. If you know what your values are, great, state them. We will listen to you. And I say we, people that care about real issues, will listen to what you have to say. But don't lie. Don't misrepresent someone else's opinion. And if you really care about their opinion, you should make a point about giving them the opportunity to clarify if they feel they need clarification. Now, there's a point at which this is just totally not possible. Um, you know, and in, in fairness, 
to people that may have tried to communicate with Noel Plum is he doesn't have the opportunities very often to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people, which I think is sort of a deficit to him in terms of live streams, in terms of conversations that might be fruit fruitful. That's an interesting word, a new word, fruitful. It's fruitful and futile at the same time. Fruitful. Now he's like people, um, which reminds me of one of the points that TJ was making in his video about Mr. T. Um, Mr. T, I did it again, that guy T. Um, is he says you can't be two things, a Jew and an a, um, anti-Semite. Well, <laughs> that's an interesting thing. In theory, you could be. Um, and this is sort of an interesting thing about the lack of creativity in TJ. Is that I think he's getting to a place in YouTube where his repertoire is diminishing and his capacity to articulate a better argument is minimized. You can hold contrary positions and you could support a fascist organization even if you were a Jew because they, rep they better represented where you wanted to take society. So it, it may on the surface appear that you can't do this, but if you think in only two dimensions, then you'll only come up with two-dimensional solutions. But the world is at least three dimensions, and based on neural nets, there are several hundred dimensions when we talk about ideas and how ideas merge together. So don't say something can't be. So how do you reconcile these two apparent differences? You have to ask questions. You can't just assume you can't re reconcile differences. There are strange bedfellows out there. So you can't be two things that seem contradictory. You can't be a Jewish atheist, for example. That would appear contradictory, but it's not because Jewish, Jew, Judaism is a culture as well as it is as a religion. So if you understand that there is a greater diversity in a specific word, a greater capacity for creative interconnects, then you would simply, instead of saying you can't do that, these are mutually exclusive, it's square versus a circle. Um, no, these are more complex ideas and more complex cognitive models, if you will. So, this is actually where I think is an interesting transition in YouTube, is where the intellect and the intelligence of the viewers and the intelligence of the creators um, is being pushed. And I can feel the push, the push on people like the Armored Skeptic, Shoe on Head, Sargon. Now, some of them I think have raised their game up to meet the new demands, the new expectation of intellectual capacity. Others are falling behind, and one of the people that is falling behind, interestingly, is TJ. And I think he has the capacity, I've seen him demonstrate a high level of intellectual ability, but I think he's trying to take shortcuts. He wants a good answer, he wants a, a powerful message, a divisive message, so that he can feel that energy he wants when he makes a YouTube video. But when, when things get too intellectual, you sort of get like, oh my god, this isn't going to work out as well as I thought it was going to. Because you don't have these one-dimensional, two-dimensional problems, you start dealing with three-dimensional problems, and they are much more interesting, to say the least. And I've sort of watched to see where we're going. I've learned a lot from the YouTubers out there, and I continue to listen and comment as I see fit. But we're dealing with a more advanced level of thinking. It's occurring. I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting that Sam Harris won some sort of a podcast award for best science podcast, which is kind of ironic. Well, I guess it's science in a way. Um, There was some good science there. I'll have to admit, I, I was sort of reflecting on some of Harris's podcast. But anyways, he, he won, but that's an extremely intellectual podcast. I mean, he takes things to a pretty high level and has a high level of expectation from um, the listener. David Deutsch being one person that I use an example of someone who's, who's definitely out there. But he's, he's very um, you could, he's very approachable as a, as a person. And, and I think as people like David Deutsch actually become more involved in social media, more ex exploring um, that venue. Um, and becoming a part of the internet change, they will grow as people, too. Because I know Sam Harris, observing his podcast and his growth, he's certainly growing as a person because of the, the constant interaction that he gets with other people who are of his intellectual capacity. Um, when you're only dealing with people of um, sixth grade level, you know, you're, you're not going to really be able to stretch yourself. It's like any game of sport. You know, if you're just, you know, you're playing sixth graders all the time, you're not going to grow. But as people are able to demonstrate their ability and be able to challenge their ideas with other people of equal ideas. Then we see a growth curve occurring. Now, I mentioned Computer Forever. He does a YouTube. I actually tend to think he oversimplifies problems, too. But I think he does. He has a pretty good game, and he's pretty careful with what he says, but, he's, but he can be wrong. And a lot of mistakes are being made in the name of morality. And this is where I was sort of hoping Harris could help people move past a sort of a myopic view of morality, a very human-centered uh, view of morality. My view of morality has basically changed, but 
to say something is wrong, you know, you, you don't question the right or wrongness of it. You say, well, it's just wrong. If you punish people, okay, what are you going to accomplish by punishing the person, right? We assume, well, the person's wrong, they should, they, therefore they should be punished, which is a very, whoa, is that helpful? How is punishing someone actually ever really helpful? You know, there are people that are dangerous, and we want to protect society against the people that are dangerous, but we only really worry about physical danger. Um, how do we re-include people back into the conversation? How do we say, okay, you know, you really did a screwy thing here. How do we say, okay, we want to hear from you. We want you to be a part of the conversation because we can learn from your mistakes. Now, one of the teachers for me, um, I didn't like Aunt Lance Armstrong. I don't know if I ever said this, but I really didn't like Lance Armstrong. And, I, and I'll be honest with you, he seemed too perfect. And I don't like perfect people. I have a tendency to believe there's no way they can be a perfect person. I like to see people's character flaws. So I, I can, it's more easy to relate. Now, there's someone that mentioned that to me and they said that they needed to see a character flaw and they had a good word for why they needed to see it. But people become more relatable when you can understand that they have their own flaws. And you're like, yeah, I, I can relate to you now. Um, and that's sad in, in a way because there's like great people like, I was going to say Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, I mean, he has some character flaws, but um, he's, he's absolutely brilliant in what he can do. I, I think the thing that I like the best about his cognitive ability is his ability to visualize where the planets are in, and where the reflections should fall on Earth. He just has a very good visual understanding of where things are and how to calculate those things. So he's known for telling movie producers what star maps to use when they're showing certain sides of the planet, which is, which is funny, but it's cool that he cares enough to say something. And he has a great sense of humor. And those are powerful traits. Um, but I don't think he, he doesn't come off as a perfect person. Um, so he, I don't feel that uneasiness that I used to feel with Lance Armstrong. I never really knew who Lance Armstrong was. I just knew that he had won the Tour de France seven times and uh, came back and wanted to race it again. I was like, what the hell is going on? This guy's amazing. I mean, just amazed me. Anyways, um, so I was glad to find out that he was a major character flaw, liar. But Joe Rogan had him on, and I thought it was a powerful, um, interesting to see how he visualized the world. And he, his, he can talk the talk, but I think he's afraid of... Um, whatever he's doing, working with counseling in terms of his um, taking responsibility for what he did. Uh, he doesn't want to say certain things. Um, and allowing other people to say them, not necessarily for him, but having those opinions. But because it's important that he take responsibility for what he did, um, he's, he's not going to defend himself, right? Because it doesn't help people that have been hurt by the actions that he took. And, and it's a powerful thing because I think what he's truly trying to do is restore as much credibility as he can, not so much for himself, but for the other people that depended on him. Um, and in a way to have the wounds heal and knowing that they're not crazy and that they were not in the wrong and that he takes responsibility for lying and cheating. Um, but anyway, so he's someone I had learned to care or think about in a positive way because of his because he's a bad guy. Um, and I like people that can take responsibility and admit um, such a major mistake in their lives because it, it gives us hope that A, people can be forgiven and it gives us the opportunity to forgive someone for a terrible thing that they did. Um, and that's restorative justice in a sense, right? Is, is where you take responsibility and each party who was affected takes responsibility and you move forward. And restorative justice is a powerful tool. Of, you know, it's a good, it's a direction I would like to see as a country, as a world, really look into um, how we restore people into society instead of throwing them away. So when we talk about free speech, we talk about people labeling racists and stuff like this, it's a throwaway society. And that's why we do it. We want to throw people away. Um, and there's a lot of examples of just wanting to throw people away. So finding solutions is, is sort of a new, and I can sense it underneath the YouTube noise, the roar, is sort of this, well, what do we do about these people that you know, just want to characterize people as racist and sexist and they don't really want to solve problems. They just want to, you know, create problems or make people feel bad or, you know, give themselves special privileges or whatever the case may be. Um, just creating communication problems. And that's really where it boils down to what we're doing here on YouTube. We're saying, well, that's actually going to create a communication problem if we um, say these things about one another. So more people are looking for solutions and more people are looking for avenues to find solutions. And that's the attraction of David Rubin. He's not the smartest tool in the shed, but he's stubborn, he's consistent. Um, you kind of get to see the evolution of ideas 
in real time, you know, in terms of what is, what is reality, how are we going to communicate in this new genre of communications. When we look at mainstream media, what has happened is we have allowed a level of deception to be normalized. And I was looking at the menu in Burger King, and I was talking to my son about the pictures that they take for the, the burgers, and I said to myself, fake news. We have tolerated a level of artificiality in advertising, in uh, politicians, in news reporting that it, it's kind of like, ha ha ha, yeah I know, that's fake. But why do we tolerate this artificiality when we know that what they're doing is they're gaining the psychology of humans. They're gaining human behavior. And what I see happening is that people are learning faster than they've ever learned before. At least a group of people, as they've acquired more information and they can research a topic individually. They don't have to depend on a news agency for all their information. They can cross-check this. And this puts agencies, news agencies, standard news agencies, on their back foot where they have to, they don't have control of the narrative. And they don't know how to deal with that. They haven't ever had to deal with it before. And so now Donald Trump is playing them for the fools that they are because they're so used to not having the level of accountability that a YouTuber has. And a YouTuber isn't often held to a high standard, like they have to have comments on, right? They can, you know, if they don't, they get barraged with a bunch of um, anti-YouTuber videos about how bad they are for not having their comments on. Um, and people will take them to task. Um, Anita Sarkeesian found out that in a very extreme way. The general opinion of a large group of people in YouTube is that this is bullshit. And they call her on her bullshit. Um, that same level of calling CNN and other news agencies on their bullshit is what's going on. And what you will see is individual reporters having to fragment out of these conglomerates to protect their own identity. Yes, I used to work for the Wall Street Journal, but as a journalist, I knew it was suicidal if I kept my name associated with them. So they would have to go independent. And I do see this independence coming down the pipe. News agencies aren't going to be able to maintain a sort of corporate image of news. It, it's going to have to fall upon the individual reporters and individual responsibility in terms of reporting the news. You are responsible as an individual, not as a news agency. So we can think of this in a way as identity politics de jure, you know. And this is a problem that because news agencies aren't a single person, they're multiple people, and they may sign off on a specific idea or whatever, but the fake news or the, the divisive stuff is being produced of low quality that hasn't been fact-checked, it's just been knee-jerk reactions, you know, this is going to come back to haunt them, whereas before the, the turnaround time was so slow, weeks, months perhaps, before they'd actually have to get a, um, to deal with the consequences. Now within hours they might have to deal with the consequences of bad facts, bad information, and someone will be laughing at them in a very short period of time. And as we become more used to the fact that there's going to be alternate opinions out there, and we will probably begin to learn what will happen is an emergence of characters. So you can kind of identify some of these characters going forward into the future. Um, I suspect Sargon the Card will go on for quite a long time in the future. Now whether he will dwindle to a certain extent will be very interesting to observe. But I'm thinking five, ten years down the road, I'm curious where these um, forces will be. We have Philip DeFranco that's taking the news media to another level and doing it in a way that is new. We will see something brand new from him. Um, and he's someone definitely to watch within the YouTube space. He's large enough and he's diversified enough that we'll see interesting things happening with that brand. And then so, but it's a five year. We're looking five years down the road. That you, there will not be news media the way we think of it today. You, you can't, the paywalls aren't going to work in the same way that they've worked in the past. Um, and it's just, it's an interesting transition. I mean, I don't know how it's going to pan out, but I know a series of characters that will probably be there. And how they manage their reputations as individuals um, will be interesting to observe, but they will have to do it at an individual um, level. As an actor, kind of, is a brand as much as they are an actor. The actor represents a brand of movie um, if they associate with a movie. And in the same way, individual YouTubers um, will be recognized as a certain brand of person. So it will become, you won't be able to hide behind a corporate brand like CNN or Wall Street Journal or... I even just can't think of them, Times, New York Times. It's going to be more important that you identify yourself as an individual brand. Uh, and I think that's a foregone conclusion at this point. I don't see how we're going to get around that. That's going to happen. Um, and we're just going through the very ugly um, growing pains of that transition. So look forward to this transition. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. So thanks for watching. Hey, I'll see you maybe tomorrow.